All right, the title of today's message is Satan's Parallel Kingdom Part 3. This will be the final, uh, final message in this series. All right. In last week's message, we looked at and we focused in on a woman who was seen riding a seven-headed, ten-horned beast, a scarlet beast. And we found out who that woman was. We talked about that. We even got a few bad comments on YouTube over it, so that's, that's fine. You know, we expect that, all right? And we found out that it was none other than a false church that exists among us today, which is called, the I call it the Roman church. And in working on these messages, I have really discovered, and I've been, I've been doing a lot of research on this for years, but I've really discovered that everything that I have read about what they promote, what they speak of, and what I've heard about them is it is the total opposite of what God's Word, the Bible says. It's just the total opposite. It, it, this, it blows me away. It is amazing to me to see just how twisted that religion is. And I know a lot of people think, I can't believe you're saying that. You know, I'm, I'm pretty boisterous. And I think the problem that we have in this world today and in Christianity is people are scared to death they're going to step on somebody's toes or they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Listen, the truth is the truth is the truth. What we've been talking about for two services now and this one here is, is pretty much all wrapped around this church. And I'm going to show you where this church is going and where it's going to wind up. Because Revelation is full about this, not just Revelation. I mean, it started back in Daniel, so we're going to hit that pretty much this morning. But the fact of the matter is, is we need to pray for people in these churches. We must pray for them. We need to try to rescue them out of these churches. Because there are so many people that sits in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and not just this church and a lot of other churches, that have never been born again. And Jesus said, Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty, pretty straight up, right? You don't have to second guess it. It's not a question, okay? So when you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. If you're not going to heaven, there's only one other option. And that's not an option any of us want to go to. Now last week, we went verse by verse through Revelation chapter 17 and uh, through uh, verses 1 through 16. Today, we're going to step back into that just a little bit. We're going to step back to verse 12 again, and we're going to pick up there, and then we're going to move forward, and we'll go into verse, or chapter 18 a little bit. So it's going to be a little bit different. So if you'd like to stand, we'll get started. Our text today is Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 through 18, NLT, I guess all day today. I don't remember any uh, King James Version in here today. It says... The ten horns, horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. Okay? That, this was written in 95 AD. So as of right now, they still haven't risen to power. As of right now. It says, They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast, the beast being the Antichrist. They will give him their power and authority. Together they will go to war against the Lamb, the Lamb being Jesus Christ. But Jesus, the Lamb, will defeat them because He is Lord of all lords and King of all kings. And His called and chosen and faithful ones will be with Him. Who's His called and chosen faithful ones? That's us. That's us, the ones that have been born again. We will be with Him when He returns. So that tells us that's going to be or, uh, Armageddon. Okay. It says, Then the angel said to me, The waters where the prostitute is ruling, so the Bible calls this church a prostitute, is ruling represents masses of people of every nation and every language. That covers, that blankets the whole world. The scarlet beast and his ten horns hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out His purposes. They will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast. That's the Antichrist. And so the words of God will be fulfilled. And this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. Notice what it said. It, this rules over the kings of the world. 
That's a pretty big statement, isn't it? And then and also last week, one more verse, Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. It says, up on her forehead, talking about this, this prostitute church. Up on her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, mother of all harlots and abominations on the earth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you again this morning, Lord. And Lord, as we deep dive into your word today, Lord, and we kind of just rip it apart and we look at it and we analyze it, Lord God. And, and Lord, we just pray that you'll just open it up in our minds, Lord, where that we will fully understand what you're saying through these passages, Lord, and through this message. I pray, Lord God, that you'll anoint my lips, anoint my jaws, Lord God, anoint the ears of everyone here, Lord, loosen my jaws, Lord. Help me, Lord, to be able to say this the way that you'd have me to, not the way Mark wants to, but the way that you'd have me to. Lord, I thank you for this congregation, this church, and everything that you do. And I pray, Lord God, that you'll bless our nation. I pray, Lord God, for our nation. I pray, Lord God, for Israel. I pray that you'll bless Israel, Lord, as they are doing a work, Lord, that is, that is starting right into Revelation, just like your word says, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that you'll just be with us, lead us, guide us, and direct us, help us to learn, help us to be able to go out and spread your word, help us to be able to witness to people, Lord, because, Lord, we know from your word, and it is falling into place one right after another, Lord, all these prophecies, that you are coming quickly, and time is running out. So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So today, that's a deep dive in this thing called Mystery Babylon. Let's see what this is. Now, we will also look into those ten horns of the beast system. That also represents ten toes we're going to talk about here just in a minute. As I read last week, Ecclesiastes 1.9, and I say it in every service, just about. And I want you to always remember Ecclesiastes 1.9 and also Ecclesiastes 3.15. You cannot understand Bible prophecy if you do not understand these verses. Very simple. History merely repeats itself. It's all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. So that means what you read in the Bible, what you read in the past, is going to happen at least one more time. Could be multiples, but at least one more time. History always repeats itself. God does it this way. He set it up this way. So ever how God wants to do it is fine with me. So remember that for a basis for today's message. When talking about the original Babylon, we know that King Nimrod was the one who was in that place at that point in time. He was the one that was building the Tower of Babel. And then we know that later, later Babylon became the third global kingdom on earth, where that they were absolute control of all the population, third global kingdom on earth. And that was under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. But it was later destroyed. And according to the Bible, God destroyed Babylon, the capital of Babylonian Empire, because of its wickedness. Wickedness. The city was known as the center of worldliness, carnality, and iniquity. Now since those three words are the three words that describe old Babylon and the things that they were doing, we must understand what those words are so that we can figure out what mystery Babylon is all about. So what does the word worldliness mean? Well, worldliness is a satanic system that can compromise your faith. It can twist your values and it will and can distort your priorities. What is carnality? It is a state of depravity that involves living a life consumed by fleshly desires. Hmm. And selfishness. What is iniquity? Iniquity is a sin that is a premeditated sin. You know it's wrong, but you go ahead, you premeditate. You're going to do it anyway. It is a sin that is continuing. You continue to do this sin, even though that you know it's wrong. And it is an escalating sin, because sin don't stay on one level. Keep doing it, it's going to grow. I promise you, it gets worse and worse and worse. It escalates. So that's what iniquity means. So there's a lot of uh, places in the Bible that talks about iniquity. Now these are the factors that we must use in order to find out 
more about Mystery Babylon. The Old Testament narrative weaves the story of Babylon. In Isaiah chapter 47, the Lord announces Babylon's destruction in response to its... Now, here's some other words that it uses. In its response to its arrogance, its brutality. It was very, very cruel. Self-indulgence and the word wickedness, once again, towards the people of God. Who were the people of God in this point in time? Well, they were the Jewish people. Babylon took them captive and used them as slaves. Just like, just like what had happened in the first kingdom, in the Egyptian empire. The prophet Isaiah also prophesied that the Medes would take over Babylon in Isaiah 21, 9. It announced that Babylon has fallen along with, now listen to this. Babylon has fallen along with its carved images and her gods. God broke them down to the ground. Carved images. So what we're going to be looking at is, if Mystery Babylon kind of follows what the original Babylon was, Mystery Babylon's got to have carved images and false gods. So history must repeat itself. Must repeat itself. Is there a major, a major city on planet Earth today called Babylon? No. No. Now, there are several small towns scattered out all over the world that is named Babylon. There's a, uh, actually a town on Long, Long Island in New York named Babylon, New York. There's a, a Babylon, Illinois. There is a Babylon in the Czech Republic. But no major cities named Babylon. The remains of the original Babylon which is located in what we now call Iraq, in 2019, it was recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. That's kind of like uh, making it a national park kind of deal. So nothing can ever be built on that spot again. Just as Jeremiah chapter uh, 50 verse 3 says, it says, no one will live there again. Jeremiah 50 verse 39 says, Never again will people live there. So in my opinion, I take that as, there's never going to be anything there again, right? I mean, wouldn't you? The Bible says it twice in the same, same uh, chapter here. But the one thing that amazes me is this. When I listen to popular Bible preachers and teachers, it's, it's online and everywhere else, a lot of them mention or think that Babylon will be rebuilt on that same spot where old Babylon was, and that's the one that's going to be destroyed. But we know that Mystery Babylon cannot be built on that spot of land due to what we just read in Jeremiah 50. So what can Mystery Babylon be? As the name implies, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. So that tells us it is like the original was, but it's not exactly like the original was. There is some differences. People have been trying to figure out what Mystery Babylon is for a long, long time. A lot of years. And everyone seems to have different opinions of that. And if you want proof of that, just go get on YouTube. When you go home, type in Mystery Babylon and look at all the different videos that people have and all the different opinions on there and watch them all. And then when you get done, guess what? You're going to be extremely confused. Okay? Big time. So, could the Vatican in Rome, which is one of the things that people say that that's Mystery Babylon, could that be a form of Babylon? We'll get back to that just in a moment. If the original Babylon was a physical place, and we know that it was, then what could Mystery Babylon be? Well, in order to find the answers to those two questions, we need to go back a little further, and we need to look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Plumb back in the day of Babylon, when Daniel, being a Jewish man, was taken captive. We know some of the stories about that. In verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 31 through 33, it says, In your vision, your majesty... Now, this was King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king at that point in time. 
King Nebuchadnezzar demanded that somebody tell him his vision, tell him what his vision means. The problem is Nebuchadnezzar didn't tell them what the vision was so that they could explain it. So when Daniel comes in here, he's demanding that Daniel tell him what his, first of all, what his vision was and then give an explanation of it. He says, Daniel says, in your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was pure gold. Its chest were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron. And its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. Kind of looked like this. And that's what the feet of that thing would look like. Then if you jump down to verse 37, it says, Your majesty, you... Now listen to this. You are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He has made you the ruler over all of the inhabited world. He has put you, he has even put wild animals and birds under your control. Now I want you to think about that just a minute. Nebuchadnezzar was a sinner from way back, okay? False gods, you name it. But God is using this man. The one thing we need to remember, a lot of times people look at people and they'll go, you know, I can't believe that Mark Carnes can be up there behind the pulpit preaching in the life that he's led. You know what? I've been there and would have looked at myself and said, there ain't no way you can do that. God tends to use the, the, uh, the worst <laughs> to get his word out. Nebuchadnezzar, he had, a, he had a purpose for Nebuchadnezzar. But I want you to un listen to what it says here one more time. He has put even the wild animals and the birds under your control. There's a lot of leaders out there today. There's a lot of powerful people out there today. Tell me one person out there today, I don't care how great they are, that has power over the birds flying through the air and wild animals. This guy had some power, didn't he? God gave him some power. He says to him, You are the head of gold. You're the head of gold. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise and take place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, a fourth kingdom is, fourth one is, an, or as, it's as strong as iron. And that kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires just as iron sm uh, smashes and crushes everything it strikes. So when you're looking at this, this image here, we know from history that that head of gold represents that Babylonian empire. The chest of silver represents the Medo-Persian empire. The bronze section represents the Grecian empire. And the legs of iron represent the Roman empire. Those two legs symbolize a division of the Roman Empire. It was an east leg and a west leg. As the empire was split during, uh, due to its massive size. Now Theodosius, who was a Roman emperor, his eldest son Arcadius became the emperor of the west leg, while his younger son uh, Honorius became the emperor of the west leg. This division took place in 90, or 395 A.D. 395 A.D. Now Constantine that got a lot of this mess started before, he done been, he died 58 years earlier. So he's done out of the picture. All right, he died in 337 A.D. So he's out of the picture. Then in 476 A.D., which was 81 years after the division of those two legs, the Roman Empire fell apart. The western leg completely ended. The eastern leg went on to become and known as the Byzantine Empire up until the year 1453 A.D., so roughly 600 years ago, when it was conquered by the Ottoman and the Turks. So here is where we can begin to answer those questions. First question was, could the Vatican in Rome be a form of Babylon? Now, I've got a three-part answer to this. 
Remember, the original Babylon practiced worldliness, which was a satanic system compromised with faith, twisted values, and distorted properties or priorities. Based on the information of last week's message, if you were here and you remember that, if not, go back and look it up and read or go through it. Does the Vatican or the Roman church follow in the footsteps of Babylon? It absolutely does. It absolutely does. The original Babylon practiced carnality, which is a state of depravity, which in involves living a life of con consumed by fleshly desires and selfishness. Now, I think that you could say that the Vatican would qualify in this area also due to their extreme wealth. Their extreme wealth. Bankers estimated that the Vatican's wealth and uh, this probably was four or five years ago, that the Vatican's wealth was between 10 and $15 billion. The Vatican has big investments in banking, insurance, chemicals, steel, construction, and real estate. I thought when money goes into a church, it's to promote God's word, right? What are they doing? They're making themselves wealthy, very wealthy. As I was listening to a preacher a few days ago, he was talking about how the Roman church in its previous, uh, previous life, I guess you'd say, used to charge its people this thing for in, called indulgences. They charged them money for indulgences. Now, what in the world are indulgences? Well, indulgences claim to absolve or take away sins. Huh. I thought only Jesus could take away sin. Since He is the sacrificial Lamb of God and He died on the cross for your sins, He's the only one. But they're promoting this as being a Christian church, but it's uh, charging you for indulgence. Hmm. Take away from sins. And to release people from purgatory after death. Purgatory, what we would call hell. In other words, you had to pay the Roman church to buy your way out of hell. What a scam. Anybody see anything other than a scam in that? That's a scam. And there were many other things that this man had mentioned from his research. Does the Vatican or the Roman church follow in the steps of Babylon? Yes. The original Babylon practiced iniquity all the time. Iniquity being the sin of premeditated continually and escalating sins. Does the Vatican or the Roman Empire or the Roman Church follow those steps here? Absolutely they do. I believe the two last answers prove that. The second question was, the original Babylon was a physical place. What could Mystery Babylon be? Well, let's look and see what we can come up with on that. Daniel chapter 2 verse 41 continued to say, here's where it gets tricky. The feet and the toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay, showing that this kingdom will be divided like iron mixed with clay. It will have some of the strength of iron, but, it will, but while some of the parts of it is as strong as iron, the other parts are as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriages, but they will not hold together just as iron and clay don't mix. So to answer the second question, we know that it has two major parts, which are the feet. Okay? So we've got two feet here we're playing with. I believe that one foot could represent, and I call it the continuation or the undercover or in my opinion, the elusive Roman Empire. Did y'all get that? Let me say it again. I believe that one foot could represent the continuation of the undercover, or in my opinion, the elusive, elusive Roman Empire, which is now known as Papal, Papal Rome, the Vatican, or the Roman Church, and other false religions. Now, remember this picture here? 
I showed you all this, I think it was two years ago. This is the Abrahamic family house in Abu Dhabi. They just have got this thing done. I think they opened it up last year, was it? Or was it this year? It's, it's, maybe it was the beginning of this year. So we talked about this. This is the Vatican's attempt to join the three major world religions together. Judaism, which is the Jewish people. Christianity, which is us and they, what they claim to be. And Islam, the Muslims. All in the one nice package. That's what that's all about. This is where it starts, right here, okay? And who knows? Hinduism, Buddhism, Voodooism, and every other ism is going to likely join. They may be building buildings for them. I don't know. Even though the previous Roman Empire no longer exists, the elusive undercover Roman Empire does still exist big time. So remember this first foot. It is a global religion. So all the religions will be coming together in this first foot. It's a global religion. Global religion. Now on the other foot, we'll get back to that in just in a minute. But on the other foot, this is where things get real interesting. It's real interesting here. And I'm going to call this Satan's fourth parallel kingdom. He's tried and tried and tried. I'm going to call this in his fourth one. It kind of seems like it falls into place. This is Satan working through the spirit of Antichrist or the spirit of Nimrod, which is all the same thing. You've heard me call this to be system from time to time. This is a very sophisticated system. It's made up of a lot of different players. These players are made up of wealthy individuals. Wealthy groups, secret societies, governments, corporations, and the deep state as we've been hearing about on TV and the news all over the place here lately. So all of this uh, World Economic Forum baloney and, and the Illuminati and all of these players, they're all gathering together. They're all coming in closer. They're working together right now. All these players have seven things in common. Guess what they are? worldliness, carnality, iniquity, arrogance, brutality, self-indulgence, and wickedness. They all fall right into that place. We now know as the com as we know them as the coming new world order. We've been hearing a lot about the new world order. They're trying to take all of everything and put it into one controlled by one person. And we know who that's going to be. We hear it on TV and the internet every day now. Which proves just how close we are to that, right? I mean, I've been hearing about this all my life, but I'd never heard it on the radio or TV or anything else until just a few years ago. And now they're just getting it out there. They're throwing it out there. They're programming people to get used to that and programming them to be aware that, hey, this is coming. Might as well accept it. We're getting close. Satan has used the apostate church like an old rag. He really has. He with his Antichrist man will join these two groups together. So you've got your mystery Babylon, which is to make up the, what came out of the Roman church and all of the re religions of the world coming together on one side. Now, I want you to think about something. When the rapture takes place and we're out of here, and I think that's easily going to be within the next two or three years, four years at max. I really do. And there's reasons behind that. And I'm putting together a, a message on that. But it's going to be quickly. And you know, if you've said in my preaching or teaching before, that I don't believe people are going to vanish into thin air like all the movies show. But what all the movies have done is they have programmed people all over the world to be looking for this great vanishing to take place. When that don't happen, they're not going to think it's the rapture. But if you have about 2 billion people and all the children to fall dead and their dead bodies land on the ground when their soul and their spirit leave, get a new body on the way up, that's what the rapture is going to look like. What are the people here on earth going to do? They're going to be told that it was another COVID. They're going to be told it was this new X disease that's out. 
They're going to be told all kinds of things. And the people that are left behind are going to be lost. They're not born again. If they were born again, they would have went up, right? So what they're going to do is they're going to, be, they're going to believe that mess. And they're going to be telling everybody, you need to be going to church. You need to be praying. So everybody's going to flock into all these different religions, people that never goes to church of any form or fashion. They're going to be flocking into the Catholic church. They're going to be flocking into anything that's left. And the thing about it is, remember this, if those churches are left, they wouldn't really, they wouldn't serve in God. They wasn't born again. They wasn't ready to go. So you're going to have, you're going to see such a massive influx of people that are going to be running and joining up and getting in with those churches. It's going to blow your mind. I mean, it's like the whole world is going to turn to God, a God, it probably, you know, probably a little G God, but they're going to be doing that. That's going to form this thing that we're talking about, this massive mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is a system. It's not a specific place, not a specific place, the way I see it. And you know what I say? Do your own research. Okay. Now you've got the other foot on the other hand. Now listen to, well, let me go a little further here before we tie all these two groups together. Revelation 17, chapter, or chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, it says, This calls for a mind of, with understanding. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven heel, heels where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. Now when this was written, it says, Five kings have already fallen. Who was those five kings? The Egyptian Empire, Syrian Empire, Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persian, and Grecian Empire. They had all fallen at that point in time. Then it says, the sixth now reigns. Well, in 95 AD, the sixth that reigned or was reigning at that point in time was the Roman Empire. Now notice what it says next. Here's the clue. It says, and the seventh, seventh what? The seventh head, the seventh horn, the seventh empire, or not the seventh horn, but the seventh empire is getting ready to take place. It says, it is not yet come, or it is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. So when that one comes together, we know that that reign will be brief. The seventh empire will be the newly formed alliance, okay, of Mystery Babylon, all the global churches and everything going together, global religion, and the new world order over here, all this beast system that we talk about. That's the other foot. So those two feet are going to come together and form a, an alliance, going to form an alliance. That's going to be the seventh world empire. They will be the feet of iron and clay. So you've got one that looks like it's got religion and you've got one over here that's just uh, selfish, okay? Now, the side over here that is the new world order part, that's what we'll call it, they divide the world up into this 10-nation confederate that we showed last week. We showed this map on there. The ten horns of the beast is what that is. In Revelation 17, they're also referred to as those ten toes. Same thing. All right? In Daniel chapter 2. Just as the Club of Rome and the United Nations have designated that years ago, and like I say, we've seen it last week, the Antichrist man at this point in time will become the eighth king. He will be the ruler of the world. That's coming. It's getting ready to happen. It's very close. But as the book of Daniel says in chapter 2, verse 43, this mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will strengthen them, try to strengthen themselves in forming an alliances with each other through intermarriages, but they will not hold together. They won't stay together. They won't hold together, just as iron and clay do not mix. So this union between Mystery Babylon and the New World Order begins to crumble very quickly. At the end here. It begins to crumble. In Revelation 17, 16, it says, The scarlet beast, which is the Antichrist, and his, his ten horns, his ten nation confederate, they all hate the prostitute. 
So you've got this foot that controls the ten toes. They all hate this other foot over here. They hate it. The one that we know is Mr. Babylon. And it says, They will strip her naked, they will eat her flesh, and they will burn her remains with fire. She's going to be completely annihilated. They are going to go in and it's going to be a slaughter. And if you look at all through the Bible, and especially the New World Order, the New World Order's main focus is to eliminate as many people as they can. Remember? Remember the Georgia Guidestones? They told exactly what they wanted to do. They left it up for about 40 years so that we would know because they always try to tell you what they're going to do. They try to play God. So we know from that that what they want to do is they want to depopulate the world. That's not going to change. When they get plumbed to the end here, they don't realize that their demise is getting ready to happen. But what they do is they continue to try to kill people off. It's, is that not exactly what we're talking about here? They're going to kill off all this mystery Babylon portion. They're going to kill it off. All right. Now, listen to what it says here. In verse or chapter 18 of Revelation, it talks about, pretty much all of 18 talks about mystery Babylon. And I'm not going to go, I'm going to just hit the highlights on this. It gives specific details on her history, on her demise. Verse 2 says, Babylon has fallen, that great city has fallen. So it's talking about this whole system. It's going to be completely annihilated, the way I see it. She has become a home for demons. So she's not following a God, not our God. She's become a home for demons. She is a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture and every foul and dreadful animal. So this mystery Babylon has become a cesspool of filth is what the problem is here. It's become a cesspool of filth. Then in verse 3 it says, For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. At that point in time, which I believe, and like I say, do your own research, I believe is the last part of the tribulation. It's right at the end of the tribulation when, when she falls. It says all nations have fallen. So all nations have jumped into bed with her. And when you take her out, the nations have fallen. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her because of her desires for extravagant luxury. The merchants of the world have grown rich from this group. In verse 4, God is telling His people that the Jews and the ones that are trying to follow Jesus, listen to what it says. It says, come out of her. Come out of this prostate or prostate, prost, <laughs> prostitute church. Come out of this prostitute church. Come out of her. I think God is telling us right now that the people that are in that church now and the people that are in these churches that's all feel good messages and not preaching to be born again, I think maybe He may be giving us a little hint. Come out of them right now. It's time to come out of those kind of churches because you know what? It's not looking good for you if you stay into them. Come out of there. Get out of that place and don't sin with her or you will be punished with her is what the word says. You'll be punished with her. In verses 5 and 6, God describes her sins as piled as high as heaven. He tells of her coming punishment. In verses 7 and 8, God says, She glorified herself and lived in luxury. So match it now with torment and sorrow. She boasted in her heart, I am no queen on, a, on my throne. I am a queen on my throne. I am no helpless widow. And I have no reason to mourn. But plagues will overtake her in a single day. Death and mourning and famine. She will be completely consumed by fire. For the Lord God who has who judges her is mighty. Then in verses 9 and 10 it says, And the kings of the world, 
Who are the kings of the world? Now and all the way to the very end. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury. And they will mourn for her as they see the smoke arising from her charred remains. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, How terrible, how terrible for you, O Babylon, you great city. In a single moment, God's judgment come on you. In verses 11 through 17, it says, It talks about how that all the merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her because she bought great quantities of goods, of the merchant's goods. And it lists what she bought and how that the merchants became very wealthy because of her. So this system. And the ship owners of the world became very wealthy transporting goods to her. And a lot of times when you read that and a lot of people think, well, that's America. Well, it, it can be America, but it's not just America. It's, it's likely going to be America, but it's also going to be Rome. It's going to be a lot of other places too because it's a system. It covers massively the, pretty much the whole globe. But these people have become wealthy, transporting goods to her. So he's given hints here of who all could be involved in this mess. In verse 18 it says, They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend, and they will say, Where is there another city as great as this one? In verse 20 it says, Rejoice over her fate, O heaven, and people of God, and the apostles and prophets. For at last God has judged her for your sakes. God's judgment is coming against her big time. In verse 24 it says, In your streets flowed the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, and the blood of the people slaughtered all over the world. So there you go. It's all over the world. It's, it's a global network. Over the past 10 years or so, I've heard a lot of people try to explain what Mystery Babylon is. The rebuilt Babylon on the original spot, as I said. Others say Rome. Some say Jerusalem. Some say Mecca. That's what I say. Just get on YouTube and type it in. You'll hear all these things. Some say the USA and others. They're always trying to pinpoint that spot based on Revelation 18's description. So maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But wouldn't it make more sense to say that Mystery Babylon is a, con a culmination of all the false religions of the world and when they come together? Wouldn't it make more sense to say that? In a global religious system. Could it be that the description given in Revelation 18 is describing the total destruction of that global system around the world? Not just one place. It's my opinion that God is fed up with these false religions. All of them. And He may just, uh, may just use Satan to destroy them with fire. But as I say all the time, do your own research. Do your own research. And go back and read all of chapter 18 of Revelation. So if we get a song of invitation, if you'd like to stand.